Boxer asked Kelestine if they could speak confidentially for a minute, and they walked together towards the doorway. He's not a police informant, Boxer said again, perhaps feeling that the result of the argument would determine whether Flans live or die. Boxer must have realized that his own life was at stake, but he pressed on in defiance of the club's lowest ranked member nonetheless, standing between Wayne Kellestine, the would-be Nazi, and the Jew he had promised to torment. Something happened in the house, Boxer said. He never ratted on them. Kellestine didn't reply. He didn't have to. He was still holding his guns, and Boxer was empty-handed. Guns trumped fists, even powerful ones. They also trumped logic, compassion, and brotherhood that night in the barn. President Boxer's authority over Wiener Kellestine had finally ended. The combination of Big Paul's diabetes and nerves meant he was allowed to walk to the front entranceway repeatedly to relieve himself until, finally, he was handed a bucket. Crash couldn't stop shivering, so Arvina passed him a blanket and later recalled that M.H. seemed to shoot him a dirty look for the small act of kindness. Big Paul helped wrap Crash in the blanket as they waited for what would happen next. Crash said a prayer in Greek, sensing he might only have a few more moments to make peace with his God. Bam Bam dropped to his knees and began reciting the Lord's Prayer. Kelestine knelt down on one knee beside Salerno and said a bit of a prayer too. It wasn't clear whether this was to mock the others, some sort of show of respect, or no more than a madman's passing whim. Whatever it was, it didn't last long. One percenter bikers preached brotherhood over everything else. But now the Winnipeg banditos stood like robots with their guns in their hands and did nothing as their unarmed brethren ready themselves for death. Boxer Muscadier had been Wiener Kellestine's friend and defender for over a decade and knew him as well as anyone else. There was a time not long after this when Boxer talked of shooting Frank Lanty because Lanty had besmirched Kellerstein's reputation. Now Boxer reached a grim, inescapable conclusion. His longtime friend was readying himself to execute him. His only scrap of hope was that he might still placate Kellestine if he agreed to join the gunmen and abandon the rest of his chapter to their grisly fate. But that was something a guy like Boxer could never do. Instead, he gave his final order as bandito president to his old friend Wiener Kellestine. Do me now, I wanna go out like a man. Wiener Kellestine gripped the black high point pistol in one hand and the 22 rifle in the other. He wasn't about to take an order from Boxer, not even one like that. Instead, he reassured Boxer that he wasn't going to be killed saying, John, come on, we're going to let you go. Then he walked towards the door with Taz Sandham and Dwight Mushy, while Frank Mather, Marcelo Arvina, and M.H. stood guard. Before stepping outside, Kellestine again told Mather if his old and loyal friend Boxer moved, he was to shoot him. Mather, whose long criminal record didn't include any acts of violence, stood by with his gun, wide-eyed and mute. It seemed to M.H. that 10 or 15 minutes passed before Kellestine, Mushy, and Taz finally returned to the barn. Crash still complained about his wounds. Bam Bam tried to calm things, as if it was all just a misunderstanding, some kind of huge mistake that could somehow be laughed off later, after a few beers or snorts of cocaine. Crash talked about Diane, his wife of less than a year, and his love for his family, until Bam Bam finally told him to shut up. You know how the game is played, he said. We're not Boy Scouts. Kellestine told Pony to get up off the floor and to sit on a chair. Kellestine put a blanket over him, almost tenderly, and handed him a cigarette. Then he apologized for smashing him with the butt end of his rifle. Pony didn't reply. Kellestine shifted his attention to Big Paul. He chastised him for bolting towards the door when the shooting started and said the huge man almost bowled over. We're going to get you guys to the hospital. Then you're going home, he promised. First, however, they would have to hand over all their bandito gear, including their vest and jewelry. Boxer said that Nina would never give away his vest unless he personally told her it was all right. Kellestine said that even his best friend Boxer was going to have to be shackled just to be safe. It's not that I don't trust you, Kellestine said. Then he smiled and continued. It's just that I don't trust you. But no one else was going to die, he pledged unless they made a truly stupid move. If you try anything or come back at me, I won't hesitate to kill you. Moments later, for reasons known only to himself, Kellestine was again riding wild waves of fury, bellowing out the German anthem. There was some sort of grand plan in his feverish mind, 
as he escorted Pony Jessome out, directing the tow truck driver to move Chopper Raposo's Volkswagen. Little Taz Sandham was more animated too. People would finally have to listen to him, now that he had a gun in his hand and a lifeless victim at his feet. He ranted in his squeaky little voice about membership dues and suggested Chopper might not have been sending the money to the US as he was supposed to. We didn't know Chopper was doing that, Bammer protested. Ask fucking Paulie, Taz continued. I've been sending the money orders. Big Paul concurred and Boxer was a little stunned. Perhaps he actually had been cadging the money. Whatever the case, things were far past a mere money dispute now. Well, I didn't know, Boxer said. Chopper didn't tell me. Taz then shouted about Carlito and Stone traveling to Winnipeg to hunt him down and kill him. Perhaps he was thinking that they knew a secret about having worked as a cop. If his life in policing became common knowledge, Taz would never rise up in the club, and instead, he might die a messy death. Pony and Wiener Kellestein returned to the barn. It was too muddy to back the cars into the barn for whatever Kellestein and the Winnipeggers had planned to do next. So instead, Kellestein ordered Goldberg and little Mikey to carry Chopper's body wrapped in the carpet out to the Volkswagen. They kept dropping Chopper as Flans' hands were frozen, having held him over his head, prisoner of war style, for more than an hour. At one point, Chopper's face became visible and Crash gasped as he saw his dead friend. Oh my God, he's stiff, he's stiff, Crash cried. At 37 minutes after midnight, Boxer Muscadier's cell phone began ringing from on top of the freezer in the barn. It had rung several times during the evening and this time Kellerstein told Boxer he could answer but admonished him not to say anything stupid. Most men would have seized the moment to beg the caller to call 911 to save them. It would have just taken seconds for Boxer to blurt out, big trouble at Wieners and his life might be spared. It was likely that not even Wiener Kellerstein was crazy enough to execute anyone if the police were on the way. Only one man was dead so far. Taz could take the blame for that and perhaps plead self-defense. Maybe they could just hide the body and try to go on with their lives as if nothing had happened. Kellestine claimed to have done just that many times before. Instead, Boxer sounded calm as he told Nina that he was in a meeting. Nina had just wanted to tell him that she had made a collage of photos of themselves and baby Angelina. How's the baby? Boxer asked. Assured that she was fine, Boxer ended the call saying, I'll see you in a couple of hours. I love you. He never talked to Nina again. A quick glance at Constable Perry Graham of the Ontario Provincial Police, and you could tell he wasn't a slacker. The 18 year police veteran with the shaved head looked like a pumped up bodybuilder, even when wearing a jacket, and his attention to his beat in Elgin County was as diligent as his workout routine. Graham made a point of passing Wiener Kellestein's farm at least once every shift. He had been working in the area for some 16 years and was well aware of the reputation of local outlaw bikers. Around midnight, Graham noticed two pickup trucks parked on a small ramp just off Highway 401. Nearby, there was also a minivan that appeared to be abandoned. Graham, who was working alone, pulled up behind the minivan and ran a quick check of its ownership. He learned only that it had been rented out of Toronto, which was no help at all in assessing potential danger. Graham stepped out of his cruiser and walked towards it, alone in the dark. Approaching a strange car by yourself at midnight is a daunting experience, even when you are an experienced police officer who looks like he can bench press a Harley Davidson. Graham kept walking forward and found two men in rumpled sports jackets sitting inside. They told him that they were part of a Durham Regional Police Surveillance Team, as were the officers in the tow trucks parked nearby. They were working together on a project relating to the Bandidos biker gang in a Toronto area homicide. At 12.05 a.m. on Saturday, April 8th, Graham was on the move again after he was called out to an accident on Highway 401. At 12.13, he got a call from the Durham Region officers saying they were about to leave the area. Two other traffic calls on the highway kept Graham busy for almost two hours. When that was cleared up around 2 a.m., the energetic officer returned to Aberdeen Line, once again monitoring traffic near Kellestine's farm. He kept an eye on traffic until 2.55 when he was called back into action on Highway 401. 
Once his shift was over, Graham planned to pass his observations to the OPP's Biker Enforcement Unit. The Durham Regional Police Surveillance Unit huddled at 12.30 in the parking lot of a gas station just outside London. As usual, they compared notes. That done, they began driving back to Oshawa, arriving there at 4 a.m. after 16 hours on the job. The plan was to resume surveillance of Jamie Flans later that Sunday, but they wouldn't have to wait that long before Flans was on their radar again. By the time they had slept off their long shift, they would realize that their surveillance had enough to detect the biggest crime of their careers. Certainly Boxer was considered the most dangerous of the prisoners and Kellestine wanted to get him out of the way quickly. Muscadier walked outside with his longtime friend with his head held high and his cherished one percenter beliefs untarnished by the venality and cowardice that surrounded him. Marcelino Arvina would later swear on a Bible that he was only carrying a flashlight as he fell in behind Boxer on the march outside. Don't get so close, Kellestine ordered Boxer. What are you talking about, Boxer replied, still defiant. I'm right behind you. I'm not doing nothing. Then Kellestine ordered Boxer in the front seat of the Volkswagen, which was hooked up to a tow truck. In the back seat was the lifeless body of Chopper. Boxer refused to climb in, saying, I'm not going to get two bullets in the back of my head. You're going to sit there and look like a passenger, Kellestine ordered. I'm not going to shoot you. For some reason, Boxer sat down. Now, as Wiener stood before him with his two loaded guns and lunatic's grimace, Boxer laughed. Did he laugh at his longtime friend for looking ridiculous even when he had total power? Was he laughing at himself for ever trusting such a madman? Or was he somehow relieved to be going out with his dignity intact? Whatever the case, Boxer Muscadier, the consummate one percenter, literally looked death in the eye that morning and laughed. When the first bullet hit Boxer, Arvina thought it had somehow missed. Boxer looked calm and had a big smile on his face as if enjoying some private, unspoken joke. The second bullet went in beneath Boxer's right eye. To Arvina, it now looked as though Boxer was sleeping. It was at that point Arvina later said that Kellestine jammed a gun against him. Keep your mouth shut, Kellestine said to Arvina. I ain't doing 25 years for you. If you say anything, I'm going to kill you and your family. Arvina later recalled that he was paralyzed by fear as he replied, I ain't saying shit. I ain't a rat. Bill Gardner, who had been walking into the barn as Muscadier was being led to his doom, heard the crackle of gunfire and as M.H. later recalled events, worried that something might have happened to Kellestine. Did you fucking hear that? Gardner asked. I should go check on Wayne. Shut your fucking mouth, mushy order. Go back in the house. Gardner returned to the farmhouse. Left guarding the others were M.H., Mather, and Arvina. Crash was still complaining that he needed to be taken to the hospital when the harmless sounding pop, 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 pop signaled the end of Boxer's life. At 1 a.m., Nina called back for Boxer. There was something she had forgotten to tell him, but now his phone was shut off forever. After Boxer's death, there was a strange sense of calm, even relief. Boxer Muscadier had been the toughest of the Toronto Bandidos. With him dead, what need was there to harm the others? It was as if he had sacrificed himself for his brothers. Perhaps they were really going home after all. Wiener Kellestine tried to calm Crash as if things could somehow be made alright again. He kept saying, we're going to get you to the hospital. Pony's going to take you to the hospital, M.H. later recalled. Mushy, Kellestine, and Sandham stepped outside the barn into the darkness where the other gunmen stood guard over the prisoners. Moments later, three bikers returned and Kellestine announced they were finally taking Crash to the hospital. Little Mikey and Goldberg were given bleach, water, and a push broom and were ordered to clean up the blood from where Chopper's body had been laying. There wasn't any conversation now inside the barn. Perhaps the remainder of the No Surrender crew thought they might somehow be spared if they went along with the gunmen. Now would have been the time to try to overpower their guards, plea for their lives, or flee into the darkness. Instead, little Mikey and Goldberg silently mopped up the blood of their fallen brother, Chopper Raposo, as Kellestine and Frank Mather lay crash outside. 